All right. Again, since I just started the online recording, this is the First Friday Poetry Spectacular. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for tonight's featured poet, the author of We Over Here Now, Scott Woods. Good evening. Thank you. So, I know a couple of you, and it's good to be in front of the rest of you that I do not know yet. And thank you for the invitation. I'm gonna start off with some stuff out of my book, if that's all right with y'all. Okay. I'm gonna start off with a piece. Uh, I used to do some, um, workshops with a high school that was really ghetto. The school, not the workshops. And um, every time I would come out of the school, I was always worried about my car. Like, would it be there? Would it be damaged? So on and so forth. So I wrote this poem in response, not to those students, but to my feelings about that environment. <clears throat> so this piece is entitled, To the High School Thug Who Broke Into His English Teacher's Car. What you know about Nina Simone could do laps on a pencil tip, so I'm struggling to understand why you would steal that CD. <laughs> that you skipped the vodka in the glove compartment but took my reading glasses is equally perplexing. It's not my fault you can't handle grammar, but it may be my fault it never took. Allow me the honor of tutelage now. Name the verb in the following sentence. Nina Simone sings. Not knowing what kind of grades you get in math, let me point out that you have a 50-50 shot here. What will you make of the ugly woman who sings so sweetly from the bottom of her stories that she becomes beautiful? That you long for her entreating loneliness in the night and wonder why girls today can't do it like that anymore? How will you explain the morning tripping out of your poster-covered bedroom and into the hallway making your mama wonder who got into her mama's record collection? Nina Simone knows who you are and why you took that, why the record called to you when fear struck your senses. Nina Simone sings, and I know you don't understand yet the ramifications of what you've done, how getting kicked out of your English class doesn't make it okay. I know you couldn't possibly have conceived that there are people in this world who can show you their love in three notes. You had no idea that some people need songs like that, songs that reach through time and pull your heart down like fire alarms, run through the hallways of your soul, banging on doors, trying to get the demons to walk out civilly in a straight line just outside your mouth, falling into a vodka double shot you can't lift on your own. I want to imagine you just like that, sitting in your bedroom, staring out a window, cracked from your previous shenanigans, headphones to your skull, scanning liner notes in my reading glasses. <laughs> Nina Simone singing long and hard into the night after a moment of trifling anger to see a beautiful thing and imagine it could save your life sometimes like it does mine every time the moon hangs there like it's harvest time pregnant with mankind's wishes heavy with the sorrow of thieves. Uh, this next piece, I am not a particularly religious man, meaning I am not a religious man, but I find that rigid, rigid, religion, religion is the strict form of religion, <laughs> I find that religion uh, is rife with uh, inspiration 
for even the most base human being. So this piece uh, harkens back to my youth when my mother would send me and my brother to church camp every summer, which I hated. Um, and I'm sure hated me back. So this piece is entitled Stalag 316. <laughs> For my mother so loved peace and quiet, she gave her woebegone son that whosoever believeth in keeping him for two dusty weeks at church camp should not perish, but have everlasting laughter at his expense. <laughs> Two sheet metal warehouse chapels, a wooden barn dormitory, the Hogan's heroes of church camps. The seven o'clock baptism tub had watermelons in it at three o'clock. This was not coincidence. Those slices were the sweetest communion wafer ever. Salvation running down our chins, their holy syrup manifested with each slurp. Today's activity, Pray and shut up. Can I call my mother? Sure, a counselor told me. Then turn me around to face Zanesville's hills. You can yell right out there for as long as you want. As you can see, I never let go of that horrible caprice. I wanted to kill him knowing that I could be forgiven in a warehouse altar call shortly after. I shouted until the hills shrugged indifferent into darkness, my throat raw with biblical hate and cartoon bile. My best two week summer friend who would die without a church service because he was black and gay, carried me back to the dorm, snuck cartons of warm chocolate milk back in the night. Today's activity, choose the ceramic Bible or the ceramic Jesus prayer hands. Don't ponder it too long. It's arts and craft, but we only have silver paint anyway. And given two weeks of Galilean levels of destitution, you'll be painting both when it's all said and done. End of the week, Holy Ghost marathon focus groups, as if we might brainstorm the point of spirit. Campers panting to get saved, reciting hallelujah over and over until the ghost came in sweat and tears and bitten jaws, speaking tongues and the watermelon's all yours. Hallelujah over and over again until your tongue sounds like you're speaking in feet. Church camp ends like all camps end. Children who learn to love their mothers while they were away, r running to the back seat of idling cars, learning that being saved now has all kinds of meanings. Years later, at my last vacation Bible school, we were packed Jonestown style into the church chapel for mass haunting. I'd been baptized twice by then, and I could not bring myself to lie about ghost busting the Holy Ghost at church camp years before. I needed saved, and I needed it right now. But at 12, you do not hunger for vastly different things than when you were seven. I just wanted the chocolate milk, but milk was for closers. <laughs> Fortunately, I'd survived the camps. I'd gotten all the practice I needed in Zanesville's hills and my hallelujahs could go on forever. There is a part of me still chanting over and over, waiting for the milk to come. Thank you. This piece is uh, for all the poets out there who are publishing or trying. It's entitled Blurbs for Poetry Books I Didn't Like. <laughs> I, am, I am frequently asked to blurb people's books. You should stop that. <laughs> you asked me after the poem. <laughs> 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 this
This book is filled with passion. The poet's love for their own work is evident. <laughs> One can only imagine the hours he must spend reciting his work to himself. Not what I expected at all. This poet's work has energy. This book is not without its merits. <laughs> Something tells me this collection will find its audience with no trouble at all. I am speechless. <laughs> Stunning. This writer is prolific in a way that suggests a singular dedication to their muse, who must be very tired by this point. <laughs> the work reminds us of the banality of everyday problems and the pain associated with encountering them over and over, <laughs> on and off the page. The art lies in hiding the art, Horse tells us. And this poet has literally buried the art. <laughs> Yeats said, poetry arises from the quarrel we have with ourselves, to which we are left to surmise that the work presented here is a testimony to a knockdown, drag out, furniture ripping debate over the poet's self worth. With their characteristic virtues intact, the artist here seeks to name the unnameable, put to word that which never had a word put to it before. <laughs> this poetry is the poetry of experience and recalls the lone septuagenarian who refused to kick the can at the end of the Twilight Zone episode in which life, in its symbolic way, has passed him by and he searches even more deeply into himself. The poet stands naked here, and one cannot help but stare, mouth open, jaw dropped, belly churning with chaotic awe at the display presented before us. The formality of this collection is so discreet as to have no formality whatsoever. <laughs> and finally, the last one, work that deserves to be read by others. Um, this is a poem I wrote. I've actually never, I don't think I've ever read this one in public, but it's very short. And it's based on an argument I had with my wife. Actually, I was answering a question and it turned into an argument as all questions are wont to do. So this piece is entitled Sur Surviving a Zombie Apocalypse. Now, you know that's not what I meant. I'm not killing the dog because I hate the dog, but because he will give us away. This has nothing to do with my slippers. <laughs> Anybody here into zombies? Yeah, I hate zombies. I hate them too. Um, but I hate zombies more. And so I wrote a poem about how much I dislike zombies. Not that I believe in them, but because I think they're ridiculous. But, but I hate them. And, but that by itself is like one type of poem. I like, if I can, to squeeze in a couple of different things into a poem. And so this one is also a love poem, while at the same time I hate zombie poem, right? So this piece is entitled, I Hate Zombies Like You Hate Me. Either, oh, is, am I, is you flashing back? What's going on? <laughs> Here is what I wish would happen. A windy November day, before the snow has spilled its milk and the leaves still grip the ground in their stiff handshakes, that, while visiting your grandmother's gravesite, I wish 
your grandmother would break the crust and reach for you, swirl her knobby apple pie baking bones around your ankle, and drag herself out of the trench she has been digging, staring at you with unblinking, pus-laden eyes, yellow from a lack of sun and birthdays, moaning from her diaphragm and her throat at once, baring her teeth after having popped mortician stitches, aimed at your snot-nosed five-year-old who only wants to know if you're going to stop at McDonald's on the way home. I wish that in that mortifying moment, you remember how while we sat in a theater in the trailer for yet another zombie movie splayed across the cinema canvas, you turned to me and said, zombies are awesome. And when I said, I am so sick of zombies, you tightened your lips and lost my phone number. I wish that your grandmother was followed by another grandmother and another and a jawless uncle who lost his way after the war. And because it's Veterans Day, he will become a wily zombie general and his moans will mean something. And on his one-armed jawless command, every grave with a flag spits forth the contents of their dingy bellies and the zombie invasion begins right there where you are while you try to remember what was so cool about them in the first place. It used to be vampires. So fine, so literate, so thin and grazed of chin. You used to coo over them too. Pecked at every book featuring a woman too abundant for corsets. Two red dents of ancient love dotting her pristine neck. Even you would have to admit that just because you've been bitten in the neck and turned into an undead count's whore wouldn't make you a better lover. You would still be as ugly as you ever were. You'd just be ugly longer. <laughs> if we are honest, we do not love the zombie. We do not think the zombie is cool. We do not imagine the zombie for a lover or a count or a Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt sandwich. None of their stories are about them. All zombie stories are about us, about the people who aren't zombies and how we scream and run and die when something without the brain God gave a snow globe manages to destroy us in a shopping mall. So all zombie stories are about autumn and brains and shopping carts and whatever else we can throw in their shambling path to make the uncool undead hooligan cool again. So here is what I wish would happen. That next Veterans Day, when you visit the grave of your stoic and cigar munching grandfather, that the wind whispers. And then, then you think about the fact that I bought the popcorn and the tickets and the gummy bears you let fall through the seat and shrugged at like they didn't cost shit. <laughs> and you remember when Gramps is chomping at the bit from underneath you, his purple heart swinging from the ventricles of his purple heart. You remember that I was a good man. You let slip through your fingers. There's not enough black people for that poem. Hold on. <laughs> yeah. I gotta be careful. I'm two hours away. I got to be careful. <laughs> black History Month is over. <laughs> uh, 
Okay. So, um, that's okay. I'll read it. You guys look safe. Mm. Where did it go? Where are you, my love? Well, I'll read this one while I'm looking for it. So, um, I don't say this one out too loud. The poem, yes, the introduction, no. So, um, black poets, I don't know if you've ever heard of any of them, but uh, across the board, not absolutely or necessarily empirically, but black poets uh, largely um, have expectations kind of thrust upon them. Uh, not that we'll be any good, but that we will talk about certain things and certain things only. Um, and you kind of notice the trend when you see a lot of, even the black poets who you know published widely, you know their first collection of work is like remarkably black, and then they get progressively more broad as their career hopefully advances. So like Major Jackson's first book, Hoops, was remarkably, I mean, it's called Hoops for God's sakes. What do you think that's about, All right? So, and then like the last book he put out was totally like, I don't even think he had an Arthur picture on it. So, and so on and so on. And so this poem is about um, telling people what I just told you and getting in trouble for that. So this is entitled, what the black poets will kill me for telling you. Never mind the trees and the wind sitting in their lines, their limbs folded pleasant, broken clean in their laps. All of their poems are black. They don't want to shake those bones every time you ask. They want to write poems about their obsession with BBC shows without having to point out why there can never be a black Doctor Who. All of the rhythm ascribed to their poetry in their introductions doesn't hit on the one. They need a jazz poem as bad as you do, more. Despite their odes to the chain link gods, none of them can actually play basketball. There isn't one of them who wouldn't trade their tenure for a championship ring. You should see them at the meetings. So much cream and sugar in their styrofoam cups, you'd think the coffee foreplay. They leave the magazine with their picture on the cover in the seat next to you by accident. Do not be fooled by the hot and tots or the smell of vinyl revolutions, or the street light cool brownstone steps they all use to braid someone's hair on. These are the bones required for admission. The voodoo they beg to be cursed by. The blue notes firing around the campfire like drunken cigarette butts tossed into an inkwell. How are we doing on time? I have no idea. Oh, okay. This we can do. Um, how about, I'll read you a Jesus poem. I, um, like I said earlier, I'm not particularly religious at all. But when I was putting my book together, and actually I noticed it before that too, but it really st stuck out to me when I was putting the book together. I have a lot of poems that feature Jesus or refer to Jesus, or, and they're not like anti-Jesus. They're really, um, if, if I can say this about my own work, they are compelling because they seek to find a relationship with someone you don't really know. And uh, all, I think, poems about people tend to do that. Uh, I just apply it to Jesus, because I figure I know everything about y'all, so I just <laughs> <laughs> apply it to somebody else. So, yeah. So I'm always trying to humanize Jesus. 
You know, now I'm, I'm not trying to dismiss him just because I don't go to church, you know. I think I just want a better relationship. So this one's entitled <laughs> Jesus, Judas, and the Case of the Old Woman's Son, a Murder Mystery. <laughs> In the voice of Judas, I, we assume. And lo, I said unto him, you could just raise him from the dead and ask him who killed him. <laughs> and Jesus spoke saying, Judas, you know, it doesn't work that way. We were passing through the village anyway, following the midday star. For days, he washed the feet and consoled lepers. And I would count the money. I wasn't greedy then, just frugal. The old woman split her face crying for her son and praising the master, brimming to her eyes with despair like love. She offered him 12 apples, all rotten, passing the basket to him humbly. He took only the worst one fumbled through the fruit for it, took a bite, and winked at me. Jesus played dumb. He did that a lot. And when we were alone, he laughed, usually at my expense, like someone who knows how the book ends and keeps looking over your shoulder. He would always appear before me and ask, what part are you at? And I would snap at him and he would kiss my cheek. The old woman showed us her son. He could not be touched. The shroud was already on him, but we swore not to leave his side. I said, would have been better if they kept him where he was. We could have checked for footprints or markings. The master bit his apple, looked me up and down like I was short, and spit apple chunks thusly, better for the purposes of man, but not for the purposes of the spirit. It was always the spirit with him. Just one time, I'd like to turn to him and say, you know, I think the spirit did it. <laughs> but then I'd have to break the bread and fish for the next two weeks. And he had a way of making an easy job last all day. <laughs> we washed the desert from our hands and hair, prayed, then prayed some more. Jesus whispered to the body, back to his hands, to the body, then back to his hands. The wind kicked up outside, but it was completely unrelated. The camels brayed, tumbleweeds batting their shins. That was not completely unrelated. When we had finished, we went to the well and found our man. He was too nervous and too clean for deserts. And no matter how hard he tethered it, his mule would not stand by him in the presence of the Lord. Jesus would not let them slay him. He took the man's confession, looking into his eyes, holding his cheeks in his palms and smiling. And the killer's tears fell to the dust in fistfuls of passion and shame. When we left the next day, we were already two days behind the 11. They would wait, but I would have to hear about it. Every time he is with you, he is late, Peter would say. Go count crows, I'd say, and ignore him as usual. Jesus was curious, always gripping at things to see how they worked. We stopped by a river and he spoke thus, Judas, how many loaves of bread would you lay before me that I could not walk on this water? Every time he said something like this, I clutched at our purse. I knew better than to challenge the master, but on that day, 
I gambled that he could not swim. And as I pulled him from the river, choking and laughing and clutching at my neck for purchase, he slapped my back and said thusly, this is why I love you, Judas. You do not believe everything you hear. And if anyone asks, you were baptizing me. <laughs> and he shook his hair like an animal in from the rain. Thus saith the Lord forever and ever. Amen. I'm going to do, I'm just going to close with one short one, the one I wasn't going to do, and I'm going to do it. All right, so, <laughs> scared of you. So this was called, When Your White Friend Says Nigger By Accident. It happens. Whatever you are doing must stop. No one can speak for three seconds. You must look him in the eye. If you were not looking at your white friend when he said the word, you must then turn your head thusly and look him in the eye. You cannot smile, chuckle, or snort. You must calculate any debts your relationship may have incurred. You must take stock of any video games that may have been left at his place. You must recall instantly who drove. You must do all of these things in the time it takes you to make said eye contact. Then, you must consider if this is truly your friend. You must consider if you have made him comfortable in this bed you are about to ask him to lie in. You must consider if you have been any kind of friend at all. And then, you must consider if you have been a nigger. Thank you, guys. Okay, we've got four judges for the slam. We need one more. Would anybody in that group of people that we've not seen at any poetry shows before be interested in being a judge for the slam? Anybody there interested? Anybody interested in, in being, in scoring the slam? I don't see any hands going up. Yeah, the, yeah, the whole the whole group. Six or seven. I'm sacrificing so that that, that automatically starts it at, at the low end of the spectrum, or at least it's supposed to.
All right. Our final judge is Mike, the owner of Karma Cafe. All right, poets, this is a three-minute slam. No props, no costumes, you know the drill. Judges, you will be giving each, each poet a score of zero to 10. Zero being, dear poet, don't ever pick up the pen again. 10 being the absolute mind-blowing best thing you've ever heard. You can use a decimal point. Please limit it to one decimal number, um, no scores of pi or, you know, yeah, it, it, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an editor, not a mathematician. Keep the math simple for me, please. Yes, yeah, I say this every, sh every show, so. <laughs> Don't let, try not to let the audience reaction sway you. Audience. Give it up for every poet and make sure you do your best to influence the judges. You got it? All right. You will be giving me a score. I will be the sacrificial poet. I am not actually in the competition. However, you will be using that num the number that you give me as your, as your point of calibration. When the other poets that come up here are better than me, you will give them a higher score. If, for, for some unbelievable reason, a poet gets up here and isn't as good as me, you'll give him a lower score. Easy enough? All right. With an apology to Bill. To shave or not to shave, tis a hard decision. Whether a gruff, her suit demeanor lends itself to professional appearance or to take razor to one's features and face the world, baby smooth. To wear beard, no more. And by shaving, we find a childlike image lacking the signs of age's tarnishments, a goal often wished by the masses. Or to keep the beard and show maturity, mature but unbusinesslike, there's the gag. For whether presented in professional immaturity or mature blue collar, collar gruffness, in neither of these physical appearances will business take one seriously. No respect, no matter your vocal or written approach. Why, without the white collar scorns of time, does the financial elite's arrogance and closed mindedness make them unwilling to listen to and consider the proposal of ideas and opportunities from outside their own social circle, despite their possible benefit? Or does this worry, this concern for others' impressions, make me guilty of the same ignorance, the same elitism, snobbery, the same posterior haddedness that which I accuse others of? Thus, my debate is rendered inert, and no longer should it matter whether my appearance I do alter, as my decision has no bearing upon my professional standing or financial actions. So, a Muppet or a Lumberjack? Alas, my choice does remain yet undecided. All right, this is where, you, where the judges will put a score on the board and hold it up. and my gigantic pen just decided to die on me. That's, that's the, y'all done took all my other pens out of the hundred I started with when I started doing shows, pen. <laughs> all right, from low to high, the Sacrificial Poet has scored a six, a 6.9 a 7.5, an 8, and a 9. <laughs> All right, that's the last easygoing one. You are now, well, 
Yeah, poets, you are now on the clock. As soon as I get the stopwatch up, I always forget to do that part. Okay. All right, our first competitor of the evening, Joshua Gage. Mammoplastic warfare. Tens of thousands of women are at risk from faulty silicone breast implants that are twice as likely as usual to explode, according to health experts. The Daily Express, Monday, April 10th, 2010. Here's the plan. Take some babies, girls, the cute ones. Coddle them on Disney Channel sing-alongs Nurse them on Clear Channel singles. Wean them on Zumba, American Idol, and anorexic paranoia. Then stick them in front of the microphone and wait for those pipes to burst. Give bootleg copies to every peacekeeping jar and jarhead and grunt to uh, distribute along with their water bottles chocolate bars, and free subscriptions of the Washington Post until every teenager from the Mediterranean Sea to the Gulf of Oman is singing along. Then pump those divas so full of silicone that Victoria's Secret has to invent new letters just to get the size right. Take this to every dictator. Warn every general, let every shah, king, and puppet president know that we've got the best weapon a bill snapped in a G-string can buy. Forget your vests of dynamite or C4 belts. We've got knockers of annihilation, blitzkrieg boobies, memories of mass destruction. So you're upset that we bulldozed your house to make way for a national gas pipeline. You're miffed that we stuffed your ballot boxes with the business end of M4 carbines just to get a better price at the tank. Shut up, kid. Here's 20 bucks. Go get yourself a lap dance. All right, judges. All right, from low to high, we have a 7.2, a 7.8, an 8, an 8.5, and an 8.7. All right, give it up for Josh. <laughs> and an unofficial 10 from one of the people I couldn't get to be a judge. <laughs> All right, our sacrificial poet had a score of 22.4. Next up, a man called Plush. Grandmother, I guess you could say, sort of raised me up on the classics like Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. It just sort of grew on me. And then I sort of have a love for gritty noir sort of stories. So this is where that poem came from. <coughs> noir, York City. The weather here is like Ragnarok. It snows, cigarette ash, and rains comic book ink. A good cop that plays the dirty eats painkillers out of a Pez dispenser. It's in the shape of his nine millimeter. Tonight on TCM, Max Payne and Mona Saxon, The Late Goodbye. All right.
All right, from low to high, we have a 4.8, a 7.1, a 7.2, an 8, and an 8. Give it up for Plush. Joshua Gage had a score of 24.3. And our next poet is Akeem Jamal. Bird's Nest. When your mother's womb becomes bear trap, all crush and no birth to your older brother's body. Every moment you are lonely, his name fits in your mouth like a memory you don't know you made up. Every other boy knows how to catch a football better. Everything of yours feels borrowed, life a hand-me-down. The asthma that makes the air empty, the suicide attempt at 11, the game of truth or dare with the neighbors that makes you question every man's intentions still. The Bible becomes written in whatever language he would have spoken. Thunderstorms become overturned gravestones and his cries on you most. You count bird's nest, every one of them is one egg too short. For some reason, all of your other brothers have too much almost, not enough just right. You search your reflection in the eyes of the people who say your name best, but all you see is question marks. You never know why you plead so guilty when there is no jury, no one is judging you. You are all error and no trial. Your first loves, first kiss, First time, first heartbreak, all feel like you are carrying someone else's books to class. This must be why no one grabs your hand at recess. When your brother dies three years before you are born, your life is picked last for everything. All right, from low to high, we have an 8.1, an 8.6, a 9.5, a 9.5, and a 9.5. Give it up for Akeem. A man called Plush had a score of 22.3. Give it up for the poet. Our next poet of the evening is Red. She wishes that her natural mind would cease to exist as thoughts of him begin and then persist. His sensual smacks have knocked her pride aside. He's discovered the secret. Real women love a nice, hard ride. As he binds her physical form with silken scarves, he simultaneously releases her more carnal desires. With him, her body has never been afraid to trust, although her rational mind has never been so easily won over. You see, when she lays with him, 
You see, when she lays with him, pesky thoughts begin to creep in. Like, can he love you? Will he love you? Can you ever be enough? Her lover, though, oblivious to her inner trials, he guides her warmth onto his pride. Gilding the lily for that nice hard ride, he flips her on her knees and pulls her hair. She arches her back and, oh no, here they come again. Can he love me? Will he love me? Can I ever be enough? She pleads with her rational mind, let me enjoy this time. It is so fleeting. I just want to relax into his passion. Allow him to spread these beautiful caramel thighs and explore away until he finds that lusciously sweet prize hidden deep inside. Damn it to hell. Who the hell needs a rational mind? All right. All right, from low to high, we have a seven an 8.5, an 8.5, a 9.2, and a 10. <laughs> Give it up for Red. Akeem Jamal had a score of 27.6. All right, and our next competitor is Azriel. Once you've gotten over the embarrassment of shitting outside, there is little else that bothers you. And the coldness of a Michigan winter is nothing to scoff at, especially when you have to shit and you don't have a toilet. Sometimes it's necessary to squat over a trash can and let fly into a plastic bag. Sometimes it's necessary to squat outside of an abandoned house. Toilet paper is always a necessity. The storage unit is your roof, your temple, your ninja den. It's where you sleep when you have nowhere else. It's your pride that keeps you here 10 months. It's your pride that loses your job and both of your cats. You do anything you can to subsist. You ride your bike miles and miles one way every day to the college in the morning. You achieved an associate's degree here seven days before you got fired. You ride here because the computers are available all day, every day, except holidays and weekends after five. You go here to work for less money than you're worth because you have a $50 a month storage unit where everything from your two-bedroom apartment now lives. You find a willing cancer survivor f to fuck. If you fuck her well enough, she'll offer you a roof a few days a week. In fact, anyone you fuck, you fuck them well because you never know if they might call you back. Your life is normal to everyone who isn't you. You don't tell your family about how you're living, where you're living. You tell only the people who live near you, your best friend, your cancer survivor, a few random meets on an online dating site. And you eat whenever you get the opportunity. You eat as much as you can because you don't know when you'll have your next meal. You don't get more than a morning mucus clog. This is probably because you're outside so much and outside air is 50% cleaner than inside air. Napkins become security blankets because collecting napkins always ensures that you'll have opportunity to blow your nose. Napkins, snotty or not, ensure that your coat will have extra insulation and even after you found a new place, 
you find yourself collecting them in times of uncertainty. If a friend or acquaintance has pot to smoke, you take them up on that offer. Sometimes you have a hard time saying no because it feels so good to forget. But you put up with your best friend's roommate because you can't suffer a toothache alone. Even though this batshit insane schizo is trying to tell you about how Islam is all about war and hate. You don't want to have this conversation when not in pain. Let alone while a knife is stabbing you in your mouth. You don't hesitate to use oral numbing rub on the afflicted tooth when overdosing Tylenol doesn't help. It's your pride that loses your meager source of income. Add this to your cancer survivor dumping you because you got too serious. Your best friend lost his apartment and moved in with his baby mama. And when you hit, hit rock bottom, you only have up to go. You call your family and they help you get out of the storage unit with about 10% of your stuff. You lose your bed, your chairs, your table, and a bit of your freedom. You lose your self-confidence and a lot of your pride. You gain a warm house and a roof over your head, but lose all sense of home. All right, from low to high, we have a 5.3, a 7, a 7.5, an 8.3, and an 8.8. .8. Give it up for Azrael. Red had a score of 26.2. Give it up for the poet. Our next competitor is T. M. Goddle. Gandhi's first annual monthly email newsletter arrived in my inbox this morning, heralded by brass-covered fanfares and kaleidoscopic plumeria patterns. Gandhi's email arrived in knitted stockings carefully tied in blue satin ribbons with a scrolled velour design along the side. Points of note in Issue 1, Volume 1 included announcements for the organizational meeting of the Ward 2 Snowmobile Club, a link to a video of Bono singing Sympathy for the Devil by the Stones, and a lengthy refutation of claims from the Communist Party and the Smurfs that Grandma killed the space alien, but she did not. No, she did not. Gandhi's email newsletter thrives on the advertising dollars from Eddie's Tire and Battery and one Colorado chiropractor informally called Dr. Barney. And Gandhi's emails do not come cushioned in styrofoam packing peanuts, recycled cardboard only. Thank you. After I subscribed to Gandhi's online email newsletter, I started receiving forwarded messages about small, docile pets who live in canvas tote bags. Apparently, the Chihuahuas, Yorkshire Terriers, and guinea pigs of the northern suburbs unionized last August, submitting a lengthy thesis of demands. But when I received a message from Gandhi's email about how much he trusts me with his eight million Deutsche Marks hidden in a Swiss bank account, and then volunteered the secret numeric codes that would turn my cell phone into a laser pointer, stun gun, grenade launcher, and piano tuner, I started to suspect the authenticity of Gandhi's email. Never did Gandhi's alleged email speak of the flashing brilliance of the sunflowers climbing between the slats of picket fences. Never did he mention the preference of wild and undomesticated oceans and lakes over the swimming pools and bathtubs, the necessity of a sense of humor, or the universal storm of all cultures and ideas freely blowing around outside our houses. Because I think that, quote unquote, Gandhi's emails were sent by some men who never see the whistling spark behind a blackbird's eye, who never sought membership in organizations of love and light. So I canceled my subscription 
to Gandhi's email newsletter, traded in all my baseball cards and collected collectible beanbag animals, no more writing in the dust from unraveled silk flowers that glow in the black and green corners. No, I'm finally coming back into the light. All right, from low to high, we have a 7, an 8, an 8.7, an 8.7, and a 9.5. Give it up for TM. <laughs> Asriel had a score of 21.8 after a one-point time penalty. All right. Y'all are supposed to yell something when there's a time penalty. <laughs> All right, our final competitor of the evening, Skylark. We evolved from birds, you and I. We came up through their throats with a hoo hoo and a chickadee dee. We are flesh and musical tone. Some have tried to separate us in fits of militarism, religious zeal, or apathy. When your children are born, I'm the lullaby, we'll say good night. Before they can say good morning, I am menomena, do 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 do. I train children to remember one, two, buckle my shoe, and that this is the song that never ends. Grade schoolers all fall to pieces, fatty, fatty, two by four. Mothers kiss away falling tears and hug whisper soothing ballads. How much do I love you? We are conjoined, never parted. You filled me with silly clowning. Let me tell your enduring love and grimace in your heart-strung grief. I have cherished you, your voices and interweaving instruments, swelling breath upon breath, mingling hydrogen and oxygen in treble and bass. Celebration! I am Willow River movement in your guided meditation. When you cannot lift up your head for the weight of stinging loss, I am the somber, reverent dirge, carrying you through life's sorrows. This is the song that never ends. Through all of this, I held you up, while daily you drag me down. I desire to disown you. I would slice away and sever your clenched unholy vocal cords from my measures and melodies. No onslaught of optimism. I clinked in the chains of another carnage. Each bloody note dragged in the dirt with the corpses you called other. When you filled me with ignorance and your dagger-headed hatred, I so longed to be rid of you. You goaded your young sisters to dance to the beat of their own degradation. You made your colored cousins eat strange fruit with strange ropes and coils. You ignored your wield, blinded, deaf. I bear the weight of my own sound. I recall each generation, their haunting chants and grim echoes. This is the song that never ends. Justice, not countless choruses, it is all too familiar. I would wrest my rhythm from you if my death would end your bloodshed. This is the song that never ends. We came from the birds, you and I. Anymore, I wish I had stayed in the sweet song of the sparrows. All right, judges.
All right. From low to high, we have a 5.5, .5, an 8, an 8.2, an 8.9, and a 9.5. Give it up for Skylark. TM had a score of 25.4. Give me one moment to do the math. Round of applause for all of tonight's poets. All right. In third place, TM. T.M. Gottle. In second place, Red. And March's First Friday Poetry Spectacular Champion is Akeem Jamal Rollins. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Big thank you to Scott Woods, tonight's featured poet. His book is available. I, do you have copies for sale here? He's got copies here for those of us here. For the, the four or five of you watching online, I'm pointing to the computer, not the camera. I should point to the camera. The four or five of you watching online, I know the book is available through Amazon as well as other large corporate book vendors. A shout out to Red's dad currently watching online in Birmingham, Alabama. And shout out to Ciara, who I believe is one of our online viewers. You should have been here. You're not going to make the team if you don't have enough points to qualify. I'm just saying. All right. We will be back. The first Friday Spectacular will be back next month with Lori Ann Kusterbeck. Meanwhile, two weeks from now, Steve Brightman and Rick Marlat here for Stardust Poetry. Stardust Poetry is not live streamed. You have to actually get here. The shows are supposed to start at 7 p.m. This poetry standard time thing has to end. Amen. When it's five after seven and you're still in Cleveland at the laundromat, that there's something wrong. <laughs> you weren't at the Root and Slam last week. <laughs> all right, all right. Enough enough picking here. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all. Have a wonderful night.